It's done. The Mueller report is now in the hands of the Attorney General. I'm Robert Costa. Welcome to Washington Week. The special counsel has completed its investigation. The big question now, how much will be released to the public? Plus, the president picks fights with House Democrats who want documents and answers. It's time for the Congress, House and Senate to grow spines and do what is necessary to protect this democracy. Those battles come as he picks another fight, attacking the late Senator John McCain, even as Republicans urge him to stop. We Next. This is Washington Week. Once again, from Washington, moderator Robert Costa. Good evening. Special Counsel Robert Mueller delivered his report to Attorney General William Barr late Friday, formally concluding his long probe into Russian interference in the 2016 campaign and a possible obstruction of justice by President Trump. Mr. Barr, who was sworn in last month, then sent a letter to congressional leaders, advising them that he may brief them as soon as this weekend. He said he would consult with DOJ officials and Mr. Mueller to decide what will be released to Congress. The attorney general wrote, quote, I remain committed to as much transparency as possible, and I will keep you informed as to the status of my review. Joining me tonight, Michael Tackett, political reporter for the New York Times. Lisa Desjardins, congressional correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Dan Balls, chief correspondent for the Washington Post. And Anita Kumar, White House correspondent and associate editor for Politico. Dan, what a reckoning for the Department of Justice, a test for this new attorney general. What do we know about how he will handle this moment, perhaps based on his testimony? Well, based on both his testimony and the, and the letter, the excerpts from which you just read, um, we know that he will be careful with this, that he, has, he recognizes that there is enormous public hun hunger to know what's in this report and pressure that will come from Capitol Hill to release as much of it as possible. The Democrats, the leadership of the, of the Democrats have already demanded that the entire report come out. In his testimony when he was uh, before the Congress for his confirmation, he said he would release as much as he could within the law, which gives him some wiggle room. And the letter today, tonight, said that he will consult with uh, Special Counsel Mueller and uh, the Deputy Attorney General, uh, and perhaps others, uh, to figure out exactly how much of it to release. But he's under tremendous pressure to release the entirety of the report. Inside the White House, Anita, are they hands off or hands on? Well, they don't have a heads up about what's in there, not yet anyway. Um, they have been preparing for this for months. Um, and this is a White House, as you know, that does not prepare very much. Um, and and they're, you know, they're always short staffed. But this is something they've been looking towards, waiting for it to come out. Uh, in the last few weeks, they've been working on talking points for all kinds of contingency plans, right? For every possible thing that this report could have. They think that the president's going to be exonerated, and they're hoping that's what it is. They, they are more prepared for, for that than anything else, but they have talking points for, for inside the White House, they have statements ready to go for when they find out what's going to happen. So that's the hope, Michael. But what do we know so far about this report and what could be in it? Well, we know what you've seen in many newspapers, uh, in the Washington Post, in the New York Times, in Politico, and other places. You've had a lot of people charged. You've had a lot of people convicted. Uh, there's a lot of paper out there. There's a huge trail of evidence, and we haven't seen it yet from Robert Mueller. So how that all adds up is what the White House really ought to be worried about. Let's look at the investigation by the numbers. 37 people and entities have been charged. Seven people have pleaded guilty and five people have been sentenced to terms in prison. As Congress looks at this, especially congressional Democrats, how are they going to push to make this public whatever it is? We already saw within 
basically the hour that it was announced that this report had been handed over to the Attorney General. We saw Democrats, United Front, Pelosi and Schumer, the leaders of the House and the Senate for Democrats, with a joint statement saying this must be made public. Chuck Schumer held a hastily put together news conference in which he also said this is part of American democracy. There is a demand, especially because the stakes are so high, for everyone to see this. It's important that not just the report be released, but Democrats are stressing the supporting documents. Because there is an open question here. If, as is being reported, there are no new indictments in this report, there's a question of whether the president can be indicted. There's a question of if there's any material in this that Democrats will want to further investigate. Even if it's not an indictment, where does the path lead after this? Are you saying that Democrats this? may want to use the supporting material for impeachment proceedings? That's exactly right. Thank you for getting me to the point. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. They're, they they are curious if there are any impeachable offenses in this, and it's not clear if Special Counsel Counsel Mueller feels he can indict the president. So they want all the materials because they want to decide for themselves if they should impeach the president or not. That's what they want, Michael. But when you think about the, the rules of the Department of Justice, if you're not pursuing prosecution, you could be really limited, if you're the attorney general, about what you could release to Congress. That's how the regulations would read. Now, the Democrats have a different path, though. They have the power of subpoena. So they can go and use what the documents they do get as a roadmap, as a roadmap to draft their own subpoenas and get information in a different way. So it doesn't uh, totally block them just because those regulations are in place. Inside of the president's circle, he has Rudy Giuliani, his lawyer, spoke to him this morning. He said there is a counter report ready. You were talking, Anita, about talking points that are ready. But what about Republicans? Are they in touch with the White House to mount a defense for whatever this report has in it? Yeah, so the White House has been working, but so has Trump's reelection campaign, and so has the RNC, the Republican National Committee. They are ready for the political talking points, um, and so they've been in touch with Republicans. They're going to give uh, talking points to state parties. They're going to talk to congressional uh, Republicans about what they should say. Now, that's all if it's good news. If it's bad news, you know, they've got to they've got to cope with that, and you're not going to see a lot of Republicans wanting to stand with him if, if there is bad news. Let's talk about that because what will define politically good news and bad news is it no indictments for further indictments dan is it well i think that the but the that the white house and the, and trump's allies will see the fact that there are no indictments coming in addition to what has already <laughs> happened uh as good news for them um and if the findings are that there was no collusion or certainly no collusion that the president was a part of uh he will take that as exoneration and run with it. Um, I mean, we're, we're, this has been a legal proceeding up to now. This investigation is legal. There's still a lot of legal matters that are ongoing in the Southern District, the Eastern District of Virginia, et cetera. Um, this now becomes a political matter. The issue of impeachment is ultimately a political decision by elected officials as to whether the president in one way or another abused the powers of his office. That's what Democrats will be looking for uh, and they will, they will, as Mike said, they will be looking at the underlying information to see what else is in there. But I think, you know, they've got, they've got some difficult choices to make, depending, again, on what's in the report. Political matter, really also a political war on Capitol Hill. The Trump administration this week in a battle with House Democrats over the Judiciary Committee's investigations of the president, his campaign in businesses. The White House so far has rejected all requests to hand over records pertaining to Mr. Trump's private talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin. That's according to Anita at Politico. Lawmakers are also raising concerns about Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and advisor who has been using personal emails and an online messaging service to communicate with foreign leaders. These tensions continued this week does the White House just sit it out? Do they just wait to this to maybe go to the courts to be faced with subpoenas? If they're looking at the history of the past 30 years, yes. Every White House, including Democratic White Houses, when they've been investigated like this by Congress, and even when that rises to subpoenas being issued, they have waited it out. Sometimes they claim executive privilege. This White House is choosing neither to claim nor not claim executive privilege. It's a very strange limbo that's making it more difficult for Democrats However, I think Democrats' mission here it is not just to get to the bottom of this, but to raise questions about the Trump administration. And they see those as justified. But we saw this week 
kind of a quiet storm from Democrats. It, none of these things was the massive, was one massive headline. But as you mentioned, House Judiciary is taking action. House Oversight, Chairman Elijah Cummings wrote an op-ed saying that he has been stonewalled on half a dozen different investigations. They are doing furious work in these committees on a large number of fronts, including Kushner's emails, including President's communications with the Attorney General about pardoning, for example, Michael Cohen. There's a huge field of investigation still ahead. Um, and coming back to Mueller, one other thing coming up this week, as part of investigations, House Intelligence will talk to a man named Felix Sater, who worked with President Trump when he was a candidate on potential Moscow hotel deal. So whatever comes from the, the from the Mueller report, there's still more questions happening. Coming. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you, but I'm hearing something that's different this time around, which is, no president wants to give documents over to Congress. Nobody does that wants that. But they, there's some reality there that they can negotiate a little. Well, we'll give you something, but not everything. We'll give you something by our deadline, but not the deadline you want. But what this White House is doing, they're not even responding by letter. Deadlines are coming and going. They don't even send the courtesy letter back to Congress, to these chairmen, saying, we've gotten your letter, we've gotten your request. They're just ignoring them. I was told by David Bossie, who's, a, as you know, an advisor to the president who went through this with uh, Bill Clinton, he was an investigator on Capitol Hill then, who said, let them subpoena us, we're gonna ignore those too. So, I mean, they're taking a really hard line um, and they're just gonna wait it out. And that strategy is totally consistent with their witch hunt narrative. Uh, if Robert Mueller's investigation, which we should all remember was part of the Trump Justice Department that initiated that investigation, if that is a witch hunt, then of course that's what they're going to say about the Democrats, and they're going to try to stonewall as long as they can. I, I think this was in part foreshadowed uh, in two ways. One is just the way the president has approached this entire matter from the very get-go. Uh, and the rhetoric on that has ramped up. I was looking at some polling uh, after the Mueller report landed about public opinion toward Mueller. And what we've seen is Democratic opinion is still strong in his behalf. Independence has dropped a little bit, but is still basically at 50 percent support of what Mueller is doing. Republican support has dropped. The president has been able to create a political polarization around this. But also um, the, the choice of Emmett Flood to come into the White House uh, as one of the, the lawyers in the counsel's office, um, he's a hardliner on just issues of executive privilege and, and the power of the executive versus Congress. So I think you have both the president's instinct and some legal firepower behind that to do what and he was talking about. Anita, when you were talking to those Democrats, do they recognize the political challenges they face because the president has been slamming the DOJ for over a year, that they may want to mount these investigations, but they also maybe need to make a political case as well? Yeah, you know, they're, they're asking for, you know, nearly every House committee now is investigating the administration. I didn't really hear a realization uh, from, from anyone, and maybe the Speaker, Speaker Pelosi has to deal with this, they can't pursue all of them. They can't subpoena everybody on all of those things. They'd be tied up in court for years, way past the president's term first, even if he had a second term. So there needs to be some realization by House Democrats that they have to pick their shots and really go after what they want to go after. And, and when you think about this week, the president was in fighting mode day after day, picking battles and making dramatic moves. It puts a lot the Mueller report finally being released on Friday puts a lot of this in perspective. And each of these fights this week revealed something about his presidency in this moment and how the president's going about pursuing his aims. And during a visit to a military plan in Ohio, President Trump criticized the late Arizona Senator John McCain. I endorsed him at his request, and I gave him the kind of funeral that he wanted. I didn't get thank you. That's okay. Not my kind of guy. In the past, Mr. Trump's attacks against the late war hero have been cheered at his political rallies, but that wasn't the case, the New York Times reported this week. In Mike's article, he writes that the Army tank plant in Lima, in front of veterans, the denunciations drew no cheers. Reporters around Washington, Michael, were wondering why was the president going after Senator McCain? Why was he continuing to play to his base? The Mueller report was always on the horizon. I think it was not just reporters, I think it was a lot of his fellow Republicans were wondering why he did this. And, and you see that, and it's, it's as though he thinks that the concentrated base of 30 percent is what he needs, because that's the kind of people who would cheer the line about John McCain. Every time he says things about John McCain, I think it puts in peril any kind of suburban, independent-leaning person, independent-leaning voter, and also any kind of senator in a swing state, because most people, I think, would agree 
that there's a certain lack of grace in speaking ill of somebody who's passed away. When the president goes to his base, whether it's these attacks on Senator McCain, usually it wouldn't work. Senator McCain's a former Republican nominee. Mm -hmm. He's a, a fallen war hero, someone who has just recently passed away. Many Republicans in Congress revere him, Republicans across the country. Others, Democrats, independents revere him. What is the point the president's trying to make here? Is it that McCain, late Senator McCain, is anti is seen as the establishment, and the president wants to be seen as anti-establishment by attacking him? I think he's drawn on a few threads. I think, first of all, it's not a coincidence that the president launched these attacks the week after he saw the largest Republican rebellion against him in the U.S. Senate when 12 Republican senators voted against his emergency declaration. Now, that's a very small minority of the Republicans in the Senate, but that's a very large amount to President Trump. And the truth is, talking to senators behind the scene, there were a lot, there are six to eight other Republican senators. They, they had to work hard. It was a, as Rand Paul told me, it was a bloody fight behind the scenes over those votes. So that was something the president's sensitive about. He's signaling to them, you go against me, I'm never going to forget it. I'm going to bring it up forever. I also do think that John McCain has come to represent the establishment in a way that is ironic for John McCain. He never saw himself as an establishment kind of character, right? You know, but, but somehow because, say, maybe campaign finance was part of that when he bucked the more conservative wing of the party, the, the kind of fundraising wing, um, I also think when he lost to Barack Obama, that's something that the kind of Trump wing of the party has held against John McCain and that John McCain stood up for Barack Obama. All of that folds into this. I, I was struck. Um it is his performance at the tank factory. The bill of particulars that he laid out against Senator McCain started with his recalling that it was McCain who had given the Steele dossier mm -hmm. to the Justice Department. So in the context of a week in which I think everybody thought this Mueller report might land, that was clearly on his mind. And then he also mentioned the vote that McCain did to sink the repeal of Obamacare. Uh, which was in many ways a crushing defeat for the Republican Party as a whole, but for the president because he needed, he desperately wanted an early victory and he didn't get it. Uh, and so his, his anger at McCain just, it's so f full at this point. Uh, and in the context of the Mueller report, it seemed to me that it was just kind of boiling over. But was there a strategy here? Was this just a personal grievance by President Trump? Anita, then, then we'll go to Mike. Is, was this about the president also continuing to rail against Secretary Clinton at rallies, continuing to rail against the late Senator McCain. He just picks these targets again and again, and often, though not in Lima, his base cheers him on. Right. I don't think we've heard the end of this with Senator McCain. I think he's going to bring it back up. Now, he's more likely to bring it back up at these campaign rallies where people do cheer. Uh, you know, we've been hearing that a lot of his advisors want him to continue to do maybe not say the thing he did about John McCain, but to go around the country and do these economic uh, events, do this for, the, for his election. But actually what he's wanting to do is kind of itching to get back out of the campaign rallies. And we're going to hear about these things. Hillary Clinton, John McCain. He's the only incumbent president that I can remember who has done nothing to try to expand his base once he was elected. In fact, spends all of his time just trying to solidify his base. And that's going to be one of their bigger challenges as they go into the campaign. They is that love. about stoking the base even more? Is that his strategy for 2020, just ratchet that base up even more? I, you know, it, it seems to be. Uh, it's hard to understand why you would, would sort of say something petty like, you know, McCain, you know, didn't pay for the funeral. You know, I didn't, didn't pay for the funeral. Care, I didn't yeah. give you permission to say thank you. But that part made no sense. Um, and so, but he has that amen corner that so far has been immovable. In, in, in talking to Democratic uh, strategists, one of the things that, Several have noted, uh, and they have been involved in campaigns that have been tough campaigns. Um, they have said that when Trump does what he does and goes into a place and you know rallies his supporters, that has a big effect, and it has a, a real effect on turnout. And the more that he's able to ramp up both the turnout and the margins in some of these smaller communities, rural areas, counties that are outside the metropolitan areas, the more it offsets what the Democrats are able to do in the urban areas. And so there is, there is a strategic reason for this, even though he's talking to all the already converted. And on foreign policy, we saw a lot of activity this week. The president met with Brazilian President Bolsonaro, a, a fellow nationalist, 
We saw the president recognize Israel's control of the Golan Heights, angering many U.S. allies in Europe who don't want to see the U.S. <coughs> take sides in that skirmish, that land between Syria and Israel. Inside of the White House, wh why the moves on North Korea on Friday to, to make sure that, that North Koreans don't have all these sanctions over them or these Chinese companies that are related to North Korea don't have sanctions on them? Why the meeting with Bolsonaro? And then on top of it all, the recognition of the Golan Heights in Israel's control. On at least two of those things, his aides didn't even realize that they were coming, right? What do you mean by that? Uh, that took them by surprise. Even Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was, uh, was surprised uh, about uh, North Korea. So, uh, you know, these two things, he, you know, presidents in, in the past spend weeks, months, deciding things, deciding policy, and how they might roll it out. Uh, in a couple of these cases, President Trump just tweeted something, said something, and just decided it. You know, the Israel, uh, what you were talking about was a perfect example. This is something that the Israeli prime minister has been pushing him to do. This is a good friend of his. His election is coming up. He pressed him personally, and there he was. He, he sent out a tweet and took his whole administration by surprise. It was a total gift to Netanyahu, and it, it's really rare for an American president to be so forward uh, in trying to affect the outcome of an election in another country. Um, but he's been consistent on that, and I think you have to give him credit for that. When you think about the challenges President Trump faces, it's not just the Mueller report, it's not just all these issues abroad. He's also looking at a situation with the, the economy. Yeah. The Federal Reserve has said they're not going to raise rates for the rest of this year. And he's also trying to get a trade deal, the USMCA, the new revised version of NAFTA, through Congress. Yet Democrats on Capitol Hill appear to be intent on stopping that. I think that's right. And I think they realize that apart from a scandal, a Mueller report, or another investigation that takes down the president, the economy turning sour is their greatest large force hope of having you know help in 2020 against this president and there are signs that the economy while robust right now may be slowing down there's a little tiny tick of concern we saw ceos from the business roundtable this week downgrade their gdp estimate for the last quarter we see wall street starting to rattle again as it has been for the past few months and none of this is helped by the president not yet having a deal with China over tariffs. So all the more does he need the North American version of his trade deal prowess to show how good he is and they get through Congress. But all the more do Democrats, are they interested in blocking it? Two years in, is this moment the real significant test we've seen for President Trump with all of this on his plate? He's got so much on his plate. And just one point on the economy. Remember when James Carville said that he believed in reincarnation, he'd want to come back as something really powerful like the bond market? <laughs> the bond market today sent a very strong signal that Wall Street paid attention to uh, on, the, on the yield curve uh, in the bond market. And that suggests that a recession could be looming. It's been a predictor of that in the past. That's something the White House would focus intensely on. Why does, the, why does that yield curve matter to most people in the market? Um, because they see that as a, a debt problem, they see that as a slowdown indicator, and they see that as a contraction measure. About President Trump, two years, two and a half years in, all this on his agenda, all these challenges. You know, I'm tempted to say you're absolutely right, and you are. On the other hand, we've had a number of moments over the first two and a half years where on any given Friday night we might be saying the same thing. But I think that, I mean, we have reached a different point because we've been waiting for a long time for the Mueller, Mueller report. We now move into a different phase. We don't know what's in the report tonight. We don't know what will happen as a result of that. But we're clearly moving into something different. And I think that the, that the, the president and the White House uh, are certainly going to be geared up to battle this in every way they possibly can. Um, and ultimately, this may not be something that Congress decides. It's going to be the, the American people in the election of 2020. And we're a long way from having any sense of what that's going to look like. I do think that even though we don't know what's in the report, whatever it is, there, this is what the campaign is going to be about in 2020. Democrats are going to say, if there's something bad in there, that there's something bad. We don't want him to be reelected. But the president is going to say, if he's exonerated, look, they wasted all this time. They wasted two years on this. The Democrats are going to waste two more years on more investigations, and I'm just sitting here doing what I need to be doing. So he's going to be pushing back hard. If we think we've seen him the last two years trying to fight, I think we're going to see another phase of that. 
We'll keep our eyes on all of these phases. This is just one tonight. <laughs> More news will happen this weekend. We'll, we'll keep reporting on all of it. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Our conversation will continue on the Washington Week Extra. Watch it on our website, Facebook, or YouTube starting at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. That's every Friday night. And while you're online, take our Washington Week 2020 election survey and tell us what are the issues that are affecting you in your community. I'm Robert Costa. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time.